Hello again, and welcome to week number one of Intro to Theater. Again, I'm uh, Dr. Andrew Friedman, or Professor Friedman, or Mr. Friedman, or Andrew, whatever you prefer. Um, and this week we are talking about two important topics. Uh, the relationship between performance and theater, and in addition to that, who decides what is or is not considered a good or bad performance or piece of theater. Um, these are both foundational topics uh, and are covered in chapters one and three. So just some introductory remarks about the relationship between performance and theater. Performance as defined by the founder of something called performance studies. His name is Richard Schechner, and this was started in the late 1960s, early 1970s at NYU in New York City. Um, and he defined performance as any twice behaved behavior. Any behavior that you performed twice intentionally or unintentionally. Now, when we think about that, what might constitute a twice behaved behavior, that's a very broad category. And I think that this is a useful way of thinking about the relationship between performance and theater, right? Performance is a very broad category under which we can find theater. Another way of thinking about this might be birds, right? Birds is an incredibly large, large category, right? And within that category, there are some shared qualities, right? Birds have feathers, birds lay eggs, yet not all birds fly, for example. So one of the things we might think about performance is it's a large category like the category of birds, right? And within that large category of birds, we have vultures, we have dodos, we have cardinals, we have blue jays, we have hummingbirds. And all of these things share fundamental characteristics, but all of them are quite distinct in various ways, right? We could pick them out of a lineup, right? We may not know their names, but we could see that there was something different between a hummingbird and a vulture, I hope, right? And this is also true of performance and theater, right? Theater is something specific, like a cardinal or a blue jay or a hummingbird, right? And performance is something broad, like birds, right? So what I would encourage you to think about when reading chapter one, and as we move through the whole entire course, is what is specific to theater, right? What are its specific characteristics, like a hummingbird, right? And what are its general or broad qualities that it shares with other types of performance? So when you read chapter one, you're gonna encounter lots of different performances. And as you encounter these various types of performances, I would like you to ask yourself and keep in mind, where is it that you encounter performances in your daily life? You may or may not attend the theater. You may or may not have ever been to the theater. Um, but I'm sure you encounter various types of performances throughout your life, throughout your daily life. So that's one thing. Where do you encounter performances, right? You know when you're encountering theater, but what other types of performances do you encounter in your life? The second thing I'd like you to ask yourself within this um, chapter and thinking about this chapter is where is it that you perform, right? Where are your performances throughout your daily life? So if performance is any twice behaved behavior, right? That then becomes a performance because you're doing it for a second time. Where is it that you have repeat performances, right? I mean, we can take an example from my own life, right? So 
One example would be this video itself, right? Here I am again. You recognize my house, I assume, from the last video. Hopefully you watched it, right? Um, and here I am set up again at my same table with my same lighting, with the same audience, right? And the same performer, right? And I am performing a number of things, right? I am performing being a professor, right? I'm performing being an educator. I am performing hopefully some knowledge um, and experience, right? And I have an audience. That said, what we're doing here is not necessarily theater, right? It shares some characteristics and some qualities with theater, but uh, we would not call this a play necessarily. Although I do have a little bit of a script, right? I have notes for myself, right? I have a text that's giving me some broad parameters, right? So that's one way in which I have a kind of performance that I engage in. Another type of performance is one that might have a less clearly defined audience, right? If the audience here is student, professor, I'll give you an example of something that has a little less defined of an audience. And this is a ritual or custom, we might say, that my family engages in every single year. My family, my parents, are originally from Pittsburgh, and they grew up eating something called Scrapple. If you don't know what Scrapple is, you probably know what Scrapple is. But if you don't know what Scrapple is, look it up. Anyway, both of my parents hated Scrapple. They thought it was disgusting for whatever reason. So a custom developed within my family that every year when we gather for the holidays at Christmas time, someone is given as a gift a can of Scrapple. It's a big, honking, disgusting can of Scrapple. Right? And then when you receive this can of Scrapple, it is your responsibility to take it to your home and keep it all year long. And then the next year, when we gather again for Christmas, you need to wrap this up, hopefully in a box or container that makes everybody unaware that it's actually a can of Scrapple. And you give it to someone else in the family, right? And that person then does the same thing. They carry it around, right, for a full year, and then they give it to someone else. And this is something that has a script or a text, right? It has rules and parameters. It has a performative element because we do it again and again, right? It's going on 40 years. I don't know if they did it before I was born, but they've been doing it for a long time. Um, and it has an audience. But one of the things that we find in performance, this broad category of performance, is that oftentimes the audience and the performer can be one and the same, right? It's something that is being engaged in collectively. And as you read through the examples, uh, in chapter one, please keep this in mind that one of the things that is challenging about this category of performance and this subcategory of theater, right, is they share a lot of characteristics. So oftentimes we'll encounter theatrical performance that likes to blend or confuse the boundary between audiences and performers. They want to make them one and the same, right? Theater borrows from performance's toolkit, we might say, right? So that's one thing to keep in mind. All right.